Fire on the Mountain, Part 13. Cricket and I had been digging ginseng on the mountainside to trade, a perilous business since the Shenandoah's main sang digger, a poor white called Round Man, had claimed it all and was as jealous of his south slopes as a moonshiner of his springs. We gathered the stuff on Wednesday nights when he was at prayer meeting with his latest wife. I had been working late at Mama's, which was so busy since the hotel at Harper's Ferry was burned, that we were serving cornbread and beans in the backyard in wooden bowls, and renting blanket rolls and a space in the barn for a quarter. Old Deal was making money hand over fist. It put him in a good mood, and he was more willing than ever to let me ride seize her, since he was in a hurry to gentle and sell him. Cricket didn't like horses in general and sees her in particular, though, as I always felt left him tied up in the locust grove at the side of the home house at Green Gables, and true enough, he seemed to belong there, a finer-looking horse than what most of the white folks arrived on. Then I would cut on down to the cabins out back, giving out one of the many signal calls Cricket and I had. This particular night, Cricket and I were just coming back from our hillside piracy, with a half a toe sack filled with round man's sang when we heard a bell ringing. It was the courthouse bell in Charlestown, almost three miles away. Then we heard another bell from Harper's Ferry, four miles to the north, one deep and one deeper. My first thought was to worry about Mama, for the bells were fire bells, but we all found folks standing in front of the home house, on the high ground, muttering and milling around, looking off toward town. One old man called Uncle Tom said with a wide, sly grin, It's Brown and Tubman. They burnt the courthouse. Brown and Tubman burnt the courthouse. He said it over and over as it, if it were a stick he was whittling. I asked him with which courthouse and how did he know. But at that moment, we heard a lone horse and a white man rode up on a lathered, sorry-looking pony, waving an old bull-primed puggy pistol at the sky and hollering out, They've burnt the church and the courthouse at the ferry, and they're a-comin' this way. An army of niggers a-comin' this way. I guess he thought he was Paul Revere until he calmed down and realized who he was talking to, and his face went cold. Where's the white folks, he demanded. Where's the old man? He asked Cricket, referring to an old man Calhoun, who owned Green Gables. Cricket was never first to respond when white folks asked a question. He had a way of stepping back out of his grin so that he was gone but the grin was still hanging there almost visible in the air it infuriated white folks and they didn't know why they all in the house mr sir uncle tom called i called out well you all get back where you belong you hear our paul revere said he wheeled and rode toward toward the whole house with uncle tom and one other following to take his horse He hit the porch with his boots, clattering and started hammering on the door with his gun butt, looking over his shoulder until they let him. Meanwhile, Uncle Tom tied the horse to the porch rail. By now, the sky to the west, in the direction of Charlestown, was reddening, and I could hear, or thought I could hear, thunder. Cricket had stepped back into his grin as he shushed me. The thunder was horses, far off, coming closer. We thought for sure it was paddy rollers. All the slaves started melting back into the darkness, and Cricket pulled me back into the shadows of the big elms. But I didn't need pulling. Horses meant white men, and we knew they would be out for blood tonight if their courthouse was burned. Then they rode into my life like absolute thunder, for it was not the paddy rollers, but John Brown's men. I looked, but I could not pick out either him or Tubman. I learned later that it was Caggy who led these early raids. There were 16 of them, mounted, bare to good horses, with one mount doubled. They all held identical sharps carbines at the ready, blackened with soot so they wouldn't gleam, and they were all masked. They all had black faces, but several had white hands showing through the laid-on soot. Oh, great-grandson, they were smart. They were bold. I had never seen so many black men on horseback carrying such weapons. But the most astonishing thing of all was they carried a flag, a new flag, an unknown flag. It was as big as a sail, in green and black and red, in broad stripes, like Ahmad's of the Sudan or Garibaldi's flag of Italy, though I had never seen either at the time. 
All I know was that it was not the American flag, and the man carrying it was black like me. He held it in one hand on a long pole braced against his saddle horn, and it whipped in the wind he made as he rode it around the yard once, twice, fast, for all of us to see. Well, the slaves were coming out of the shadows now. We heard the windows scraping shut in the house behind us while we slaves gathered in the yard at gunpoint. There must have been 20 of us in all. I've never seen men and women so eager to be held at gunpoint, even fetching their children for the honor. The horses stood stamping and blowing in the dust while the rebels sent two of us out back with the rider to empty the smokehouse. It was the end of the summer, and all they found were two of last year's hams, which the slaves had neglected to steal themselves. Somebody else came up with two sacks of yellow cornmeal. We only heard one sound from the house, a window scraping slowly open. In a flash, an abolitionist turned around and fired. A bullet whined off the slate roof, and the window slammed shut again. No more was seen or heard from the, from the home house. Brown's men were all silent, except for one African who barked out orders and made no attempt to explain their actions. I understood right away that they were robbing us at gunpoint, so none of us could be accused of helping them, protecting us not just from the whites, who were too scared to be watching anyway, but from the traitors among us. They demanded horses, and Uncle Tom delivered up Paul Revere's pony without hesitation. I admit I hesitated for a moment, but only a moment, before I went to the locust grove and pulled seize her from the shadows, and without a tear, those came later, on command for Deal and his belt whip, I handed the reins to the rider who was doubled up, who obligingly held a sharps in my face. Then he did the strangest thing. He bent down, and his rifle touched my cheek, like a cold little pat, and I burst into tears. Cricket thought he had hurt me, and pulled me back angrily, cocking his fist and swearing at the man. But I wasn't hurt. I wasn't scared. The man behind this rider was wounded. He held his side and groaned as he slid off the back of the mount, and Uncle Tom helped him on to seize her. I patted his long old cold nose fondly and backed away, never to see him again. He was killed at Signal Knob. Then they were gone. I don't remember them riding away, but I remember their hoof beats and someone shouting, Fire! Folks were banging on the door of Green G Gables, while others milled around in the darkness, confused. Somebody in the house was firing shots at the sky, out a window, while a few shadowy figures threw hay bales against the smoldering woodshed at the side of the house. Good Lord, Miss Anne, they set the house afire. It was burning, though it was to be put out and didn't truly burn until later in the war. It wasn't Brown's men who had started the fire, though of course they were blamed. Equally characteristic of the confusion of the times was that collectively at last, the same Africans who set the house on fire helped put it out. Cricket was shaking me by the shoulders. Did he hurt you? Did you see those guns? Did you see that flag? Are you crying because they took your old horse? It wasn't an old horse, I said. Tears that I could not understand until decades later were streaming down my face. I had, sne I had seen freedom and yes, great-grandson, I wanted it. Bad. Though I was only twelve, youth and age drink from the same deep pool, and I knew then, as now, the sorrow in the heart of joy. I knew that I was saying goodbye not only to my horse, but to my mother and my childhood as well. I rode off with those horsemen, and I am riding with them still. One of the goals of the USSA's second five-year plan, 1955 to 1960, was to reduce dependency on Canadian and Menosimi, Menomini small grain, and much of the former pasture land in the northern Shenandoah was golden with wheat. The valley opened out be between Charlestown and Martinsburg, and it was like setting out on a golden sea. It's beautiful from an airship, Grissom said. I wouldn't know, Yasmin said. She had called, but the car wasn't ready. Afternoon for sure, Mr. Card Cardwell had said. Since they had to wait around all morning anyway, Grissom was driving her in his little Hummer to Martinsburg to meet Laura May Hunter, the owner of the Hunter Letters. Harriet had stayed behind, to sleep late, Yasmin said, and to read. And watch vid, Grissom ventured. I guess. The dust storm on Mars will be all over the news today. 
At least it will hold things up so we can get to Staunton, and Leon's mother won't have to watch the landing alone. I suppose you think I'm totally reactionary and neurotic for never talking about it. End of part 13